Hello, welcome back to ME4111. Um, I've gone on to just putting up um, some slides on last year's exam paper. Uh, so we'll do a walk over, uh, or sorry, a walk through of the, the solution methodology for those. I mean, I'm going to focus on the methodology for this because that's where the marks are come from. So I want you to get bogged down on the precise numbers. As long as your approach is sound, uh, that's what I'm looking for evidence of. So really, I need to see your workings and it needs to be clear to me how it is you're approaching your solution. And if you're making small calculation errors, we're not very worried about that. But uh, I'm also very worried about stuff that um, is not you know, demonstrating your, your, your understanding of it. So um, we'll go through each of the questions in turn. We start with question one. Uh, so it's worth 20 marks, so there's two parts to it. Uh, so it is kind of an installation type thing. So some sort of a Dermot Valentine's fixture put into a house. Uh, so a massive 50 kgs so or maybe chandeliers or something uh, hanging off these uh, cables and we're asked to determine the tension of the cables AB which is this one here and AC and we're given some geometric constraints on those so you straight away see that from these we have the directions of these cables so if we think in terms of forces we would know the directions of the force uh, that's causing the tension in AB and also in AC um, now, just to refresh some stuff, um, obviously this is going to be pointed down. It's going to have the weight of that, and we know because these cables are in tension that the force AC is going in that direction. Okay, and again, we have that from consideration of free body diagrams of the cables in tension. If you draw the free body diagram of the point A, which is the focal point of our analysis, then uh, we need a corresponding force to cancel it out. Okay. So that's a point A. So that would be the combination of the, of the two free body diagrams, and this is uh, cable AC there. Okay. So likewise, uh, we have a direction like that for that force. So in this question, we're told to use the uh, graphical approach, and obviously for that, uh, you need to have your um, protractor, your uh, compass, etc., your drawing tools, and again, you know, a cheap mathematical set will do. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. If you're absolutely stuck, <clears throat> you can sketch this out. So if you didn't have those materials, you could have done that. Uh, what was not accepted in this was um, an analytical approach because we're checking for the learning outcome of the graphical approach. Um, so a lot of students try to do this because they just um, choose not to see this aspect to it. Uh, and again, it's something that I emphasize a lot during the course that I really like this graphical approach because it really um, demonstrates your understanding of uh, the directions. And uh, it's actually really easy as well. Uh, it's much easier to do this graphical approach than it is the analytical approach in this question. Right, so our solution then is very straightforward. So we're picking point A up here, and I started my crosshairs here, so that's my origin. And because the system is in equilibrium, we know that this force comes down, that's um, the, the weight, uh, 500 newtons. Obviously, okay, 490.5 is precisely what it is, but when you're drawing out these lines, 500 is fine, and uh, we come down to here. So we start at the origin and we come down to there. So say whatever, five centimeters long uh, or on the four-bit scale. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we know the directions that these are coming off in, uh, but we don't know how long they need to be. So what we do is we start in at one end. So from where we were, if I take this force AC next, well, I know it's going to shoot off in that direction, but I don't know um, how far it's going to go. But what I do know is that when uh, AB is added onto it, that it comes back to here. So AB ends at that location. So if I draw that in orange, again, I can shoot a line off uh, in that direction. I've measured off these angles, or worked them out from the inverse tens uh, of 0.8 over 1.2, and uh, 1.2 over 2 meters here for that angle up there. Okay? So that's where I'm getting these angles of 31 and 34 from. And where these intersect, uh, then uh, all I do is marked it off, that's my triangle closed, and now I measured the length of this off, and convert using my scale, and I measured the length of this off, and that gives me uh, FAC and FAB. And it couldn't be easier. Uh, so again, you just draw to scale, tip to tail, that's the NMI, it's in the notes, and that's the way those forces combine to come back to zero. Okay, so very, very straightforward on that. Uh, part B then, again, looks uh, quite complex. Um, so we're given a force of 1.2 kilonewtons, 
uh, were asked to determine the magnitude and direction of the moment due to this force about the axis OO, so about this axis here. So I want to know what's the road turning effect uh, due to this force about that axis. Um, now, there's a number of ways you can do this. You can break this into components and uh, take the moments due to the components about that axis. So what I'm going to do is just do the old school way using the vector cross product. And I've worked it out here. So I have my magnitude of my force is 1.2 kilonewtons. And what I've done is I've broken this force down into its um, i hat, j hat, and k hat components. So I start, <coughs> excuse me, I started with the k hat. Uh, so this component here. Okay, and that's uh, 1.2 times the sine of 60. Okay, so that's straightforward. Uh, now I want the um, i hat and j hat. So if I go to this part here, which I've highlighted in blue, that there is uh, 1.2 cos 60. And if I take the um, cosine of that, sorry, that component times the cosine of 40 will give me the i component, and the sine of 40 times that component will give me the j hat direction. So I've got 1.2 cos 60, which is the green bit. So I should change that back into green. Uh, here. So that's the 1.2 cos 60. And here we have it there. And then the cos 40 of that gives me the i hat term, and the sine 40 of it gives me the j hat term. Okay. So I worked it out, and that's what I get then for my um, vector f expressed in its i hat, j hat, and k hat components. Now I want the um, displacement vector from where I'm taking the moment. So I'm going to pick the point um, on this. Uh, it's on the oval axis. So from here to anywhere on the line of action of the force. So I have picked uh, this location. So if I pick this angle, sorry, this uh, vector here, uh, that. Uh, I should get to write in, see if I can do it. Uh, or, oh, I'll put something like that. No, it's gone, it doesn't want to do it. Uh, so much for the blue bone. I'll write in by hand uh, with the thing red. So, or, O, A. Okay, so it's this displacement vector that I'm after. So again, that is 0 i hat plus 0.3 j hat minus 0 0.2 minus 0 0.105 k hat. So again, what I'm doing is if I'm standing here, give myself directions to get this point here. So I don't go anywhere in the i hat direction, so the x direction is out that way. Uh, in the j hat direction, I come out 0.3. So that's my distance there. So I'm coming out 0.3 there in my y direction. And my z direction is obviously up. So from here, I got to go minus in z right to that. So I got to go the 0.2 minus 0.105. This has the distance from there to there. Okay, so that gives me the displacement vector. And I'm going to take the vector cross product of those two. Okay, so uh, I set up my determinant. So the moment is R away cross F. So again, the sequence of this is important. It's R away cross F, not F cross R. Uh, I set up my determinant i hat j hat k hat. That's my r uh, displacement vector uh, here, and then my force vector there. Okay, and I worked it out, and I get this answer here uh, once I punch the numbers on that. Now my answer here is written as m o o is the 0.275 kilometers um, anti-clockwise. So you can see that I picked out the i hat term. Because what I'm after is the moment about the i hat axis, okay, about the x axis. So this gives me the moment about that. So I just pull that out, okay, and that gives me my answer. So again, um, pretty straightforward stuff, same kind of stuff that we're doing in the tutorial sheets. Now, the next question, question two, was uh, a biomedical flavored one. And what's nice about this is that, you know, it looks complicated, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. Again, with all of these, you just got to take time to digest it and um, figure out what you're going to do. So we have a procedure to value the strength of the triceps muscles. So that's done there. And um, the person pushes down vertically on the load cell with the palm of their hand, as indicated. So we have the load cell here and the push pressing down on this. 
And the mass of the lower arm, including the hand, is uh, 1.5 kilograms, so that's acting there. So we've got a, a weight for the, the lower arm. So if the load cell is reading 160 newtons, so turn the vertical tensile force F generated by the triceps muscle. So we're told that this is producing um, a force and that's pushing down onto this load cell. I want to figure out what that is. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is draw a free body diagram and we need to understand, well, what is our system? And our system here is the lower hand, okay? Uh, because this is just attached, it's like a cable. Um, and we also have contact here with the, uh, the elbow, okay? So that's the nuance of, of this. So if we look at our free body diagram, and uh, remember the whole point of the free body diagram is that this is how you base your solution, so it's your model of the system. And we see that I've just represented the lower hand as just a beam. And I've indicated the weight. Uh, I have the triceps uh, coming up. I've shown the hinge joint at point O, which is where the elbow is. And I haven't drawn the trice, uh, the humerus or the triceps in. Okay, so the triceps is like a cable, it's just transferring a load. And again, the humerus is just where there's contact. Okay, so the humerus will be located here. So instead of contact, I've replaced that with reaction forces. Okay, so this is supported by the humerus and supported here at the table or at the load cell. So with my hinge joint, um, I have a reaction force in the y direction. I also have a reaction force in the x direction uh, of my weight. And then I have the reaction force from the load cell. Now, where a lot of students did in this uh, question was they got the direction of this wrong because they said, oh, it's pushing down. Um, the hand is pushing down, but from the perspective of the hand, if you're the system, the, the lower arm, you're feeling the load cell push you back. Um, so that's the direction of the reaction force. It's against the attempted motion, okay? And the way to think about that is, well, if this wasn't there and you push down, well, it would move down. So you gotta resist it, you gotta move against it. All right, so that's how you determine the direction of that. Uh, so that was a, a mistake that uh, a lot of students made in this particular question. Uh, just for a finish then, to clear, clear, close out the um, free body diagram, I have my uh, coordinate system. Right, so I take a look at this and um, decide, right, how am I going to attack this? I'm after the force in the triceps. So if I took moments about here, uh, I know W, I know that, I just have this as an unknown. Uh, there's no moment due to OX or OY. So this will give me the force in the triceps straight out. Okay, so I target that. I take moments about 0. 0.0. So again, uh, FT times my distance is 25 and my various moments there, we've seen the previous tutorial sheets for that. So that gives me the force in the triceps is 183, 1.7 newtons. Okay, and you can round it off to 183 too. And again, it's interesting there, like the force is produced at the hand um, is 160. Uh, so the triceps is producing an awful lot more force. And again, that makes sense because it's, it's got a shorter distance to produce that moment over. And the second part would then ask me to term the reactions at the elbow. So if I look in the X direction, I've already got one force acting in the X direction. So the reaction force at X in the X direction is zero. And then I can sum the forces in Y. I know FT, um, I have a Y, W, and 160. Okay. And uh, from that, I get OY is minus 1977 Newtons. And that minus sign is telling me that the direction is for OY is opposite to the way that I have it drawn there in the free body diagram. Okay, so a situation that, you know, if you look at it here, it looks really, really complicated. It's got this kind of weird geometry and all sorts of stuff going on. But uh, it ends up being a very, very straightforward problem. So don't get distracted um, or intimidated by the geometry. Just take your time. The, the actual working of this was, was pretty straightforward. Uh, and, and that's a hallmark of engineering. Engineering is really about common sense and just using the, the skills that you have to new, new situations. Right, uh, the next question, uh, question three, again, uh, 3D looking problem. So we got a bell crank, um, the vertical force P on the foot pedal is required to produce a tension T of magnitude 400 into the vertical control rod. So P pushes down there and it produces a force in that direction of 400 newtons. Okay, 
and it's supported there at A and at B. So again, with these, just always take stock and try and figure out okay, what, what is going on, how do I understand this? And we're asked to determine the reaction forces at A and B. Okay, so that's telling us what well, this is an equilibrium problem. So let's figure out the reaction forces. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to draw a free body diagram. Okay, and I've drawn one here. And as I said before, I'm not the best at art, but uh, this is sufficient for me to understand what's going on. Again, what I've done is um, I've taken away the contact. So I'm just showing the, the crank here. I've got my force P acting down. I'll just change colors here to, to this. So I have P acting down. I have my 400 newtons uh, acting out. So there are the externally applied forces. There's a bit of an offset here um, for this one. Uh, I have my X direction, my Z direction, and my Y direction. Okay. So, sorry, Y is off that way. Um, so I have those. And at point A and at point B, I have my reaction forces. So again, this kind of thing, it would allow a rotation because it's a bearing support. So there won't be any moment reaction, but it stops it moving in the X direction and stops it moving in the Y direction and um, also in the Z direction. Okay. So again, that's my model of it. So now what I want to do is uh, take stock of what I'm after. So the first thing I want to do is try and figure out what P is. Um, and looking at this, what would tell me what P is? Well, the x-axis here you can see is going through points A and point B. And if I take moments about this, it'll knock out these. Okay, and I'm just left to P and 400 newtons causing moments. So I'm going to take moments about that point. Um, and because these are coming in in one direction. So they're confined to the Z direction, plus or minus. Uh, both of them actually are minus. So I can take moments uh, due to those about the X axis. Okay, just as um, a 2D problem, essentially a 1D problem really. Um, so again, looking in from the X axis, um, I look at the rotations caused by this force and this force. So I've got P times 200 uh, minus 400 times 120 cos 30. So 120 cos 30. This distance here is 120, and the cosine of the angle is 30. So that gives me that distance here. Okay, so that gives me P out to be 208 newtons. So now that I have P, what I can do is use another moment equation and target um, to solve one of the other unknown forces, sets of forces. So again, if I look at, uh, just change colors here. If I move my axis now to a y-axis going through point A, okay, so I've shifted my y-axis out that way, and I'm taking moments about that axis. And again, we're taking it up, and you're free to take moments about anywhere whatsoever. So again, I'm targeting what I'm doing, and I'm eliminating all the unknowns at point A in the equation. So I'll be left with P, uh, B, and the 400. So again, looking in from the y-axis, I take moments there, and that gives me Bz output as 424 newtons, and then I can use the sum of the forces equal zero to work out what Az is, okay? So sum of the forces in Z equals zero, so that gives me Az out to be 183.9. And the reaction forces in the y-direction are equal to zero, so they're all equal to zero, and do the same for the uh, x-direction. Okay, so really with this, what I'm doing is it's testing uh, my ability to plan my attack, uh, to figure out the unknowns, and I need to be very comfortable taking moments. So the moments that I'm taking are essentially a series of 2D problems. Uh, I'm taking moments about axes, because uh, that's eliminating things uh, very conveniently for me. But my attack is very deliberate here. Again, I could equally have chosen uh, this location here uh, to go for the, uh, the y-axis. The other approach for this, which is perfectly valid as well, is to pick a location and um, so say I go for point A here and I just take 3D moments due to each of the forces so I work out the displacement vectors to all of these forces okay so I write those out and then I take moments due to all of those and set them equal to zero and then I would pull out a series of equations that would allow me to solve for these okay so that would be a little bit of overkill uh, but it's a perfectly valid approach and some students did that and uh, they were able to work it out
So if in doubt, you can always go to the vector cross product, pick a location and take moments about that location in 3D. That's fine to do also. It's just because in this force, the forces are constrained to particular directions and the looking in and taking moments with axes works very, very uh, efficiently. Um, and that, that's if you're quite comfortable at, at doing that. Not all people are, so if you're not, it's fine to go for the um, taking moments about one point in 3D. Now, the last question uh, that I'll cover is the um, force coupled system. So again, we have this uh, beam. It's got um, a lot of stuff happening on it. It's got um, all these forces. We're told to neglect its mass, so forget about the mass of it. So we don't have any weight factor. And we want to have a single force coupled system at point O, so down here. And then for the second part, it's to determine the apparent location of the resultant force. So a couple of marks for that. Right. Uh, <clears throat> with these, again, we've done loads of them in the tutorials. Uh, there's two steps. Step one is the translational effects. Step two is the rotational effects. So for the first step, uh, we simply write the resultant is the sum of the forces. So we move all the forces down to point O and we sum them up. So I've broken each force into its components uh, in terms of I hat and J hat. So I have minus three J hat, I leave it in kilonewtons. Uh, minus 1.4 cos 30 j hat plus 1.4 sine 30 i hat. Okay, so that's breaking that into its two components. Come like that, and the component comes down like that. So I sum those up and again, minus, or sorry, 0 0.7 i hat minus 4.2 j hat. Uh, the second step now is to look at the rotational effects uh, about 0 0.0 due to those forces and any other uh, couples that are there. So the first thing is I have this couple here, the four kilometer, sorry, four kilonewton meter one. And um, the direction of that is uh, anti-clockwise, which in my convention using the right hand rule is positive. So I got plus four, and then I take a moment due to this, which is three times 1.8. And again, that's swinging in that direction. So that gives me a minus. Um, then I have the, uh, just clear that up a little. Um, I have the rotations due to this. So I've got two of those one there and one there. So I look at each of those components. So I'm just going to start with the, um, this one and this one. So if I take this distance here, uh, I need that distance for this moment and I need this distance here for the other component, okay? And that's what I've done here is added those distances up, take those out. And that gives me minus six uh, kilonewton meters. So my answer then is a resultant force of 0.7 i hat minus 4.2 j hat kilonewtons and a moment of minus six kilonewton meters at point O. The last part then is, well, where is that located? So what I've done is I'm using simply the magnitude of the moment is force times distance. So the magnitude of my moment is six and my distance, my force is 4.2. So what I've done is I've taken taken the y component here, just the size of it. Okay, not taking the minus, just the size of it. Uh, why have I done that? The uh, I want to figure out how far relative to O I could locate this uh, resulting force. And I want to do it in the x direction. So I need the y component of the force for that. If I took the uh, I hat term there, I'd be looking in the y axis relative to point O. So again, I, I could do that. I could find locate where that force is. Okay, but uh, given the way this is in, in terms of the beam, it's better to locate it in terms of where it is in the beam, where it cuts the beam. So I'm going to do it in terms of the uh, J hat. Okay, so I take the 4.2. And so I get 6 equals 4.2 times D. Solve for D is 1.43. Now my moment is a uh, negative. Okay, so it's swinging around in that direction. So if I'm here, and uh, I'm going to locate the moment, uh, the, the reaction force somewhere along this line, where does it need to be relative to O to give a negative or a clockwise rotation? And it's got to be out this way. Okay, so it's got to be heading out that, this side of it. So it's uh, 1.43 meters in the positive x direction from O. So that's where it is effectively located. Okay, and obviously my reaction force has the vertical component and also the 
and um, I was going to draw it. Let's change colors maybe. So it's a bit like that. Because uh, it has, um, geez, that's an awful draw. Screw it out. Um, so it'd be a bit like this, isn't it? So that's more right. Now it's not quite as angled as that. It's um, plus 0.7i minus 4.2j. So it's just kind of tilted a little bit. Okay. So this would be the vertical. And that's uh, 1.43 meters. So that's effectively where it's located. Uh, if you took the y term, or sorry, the uh, i hat term in, in this here, but instead of the 4.2, you took the 0.7. What you'll be figuring out is where it cuts it uh, up here. So I'll be working at this distance here. Okay. Uh, relative to point O. All right. Whereas we worked out was this distance here, which is the 1.43. Okay. That concludes that. Uh, the last question in that exam was on centroids, and obviously we didn't get to cover centroids. So, you know, it'd be a bit unfair to give you exams on that stuff. So I won't cover that. But um, the key thing I want to stress with you is that your approach is clear uh, when you're working through these. That um, when you're doing a diagram, you know, working through equilibrium, we're drawn free by diagrams. There's a lot of marks going for that. Um, there's a clear statement of what principle I'm doing, where I'm taking moments, for example. Um, complete mathematical statements. Again, I'm not saying lefty equals right here. I'm saying the sum of the moments equals zero. Okay, so my equation is written out explicitly, and then it's worked out. And when I'm grading, I'm looking for evidence of this. So I'm looking for this kind of a statement. I'm checking this. I'm looking for full mathematical statements. A lot of students are in the habit of, you know, just writing down numbers and not writing down the equal zero. That equal zero is hugely important. And um, they take components and then add them together and do kind of all sorts of crazy stuff that makes sense in their heads. But you have to look at what you've actually written down on the sheet of paper. So you may be able to follow what you're writing out uh, in like a shorthand that you use for yourself, but you have to write proper grammar. So, to, you know, think of in terms of a language. We use maths to communicate, uh, meaning very, very efficiently. So this is, is a statement that uh, these things sum up to zero. And um, you can't go adding bits on and things like that just because um, it's your way of working through things. You need to structure it out and write it clearly. Um, show your free body diagrams, uh, label things. The marks are going for your attempts. If you try to do this problem, solve this problem here without drawing the free body diagram, you're, you're mad. So you're going to get zero uh, if you do that. And you know this question had 15% uh, going for it. So if you try and solve this without doing a free body diagram, you're getting zero out of 15. It's, it's very straightforward to, to mark. Um, so always set out your free body diagram. Uh, and then the equations, you can always see that I'm demonstrating what equations I'm applying, where I'm getting these, these equations from. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is, I suppose is most manifest in this, <clears throat> is the freedom that we have as engineers to, to choose where we're getting our solution from. Um, so take your time to read the question, understand what it is asking, and then figure out your plan of attack. Um, if you go into this with a rote learning mindset where you're trying to tackle things, just, oh, this is this type of problem, therefore I do this, um, you're likely to not come out very well from it because you need to pause and think and plan your attack. If I take a moment about a particular location, so when I'm taking a moment of this axis here, uh, I knock out the reaction forces and left with P and this, so I'd easily get solved P out of that. Okay, that's why I'm taking moments about this axis. And um, so thinking along those lines, uh, if I took moments about the y-axis, for example, um, I'm going to get a P knocked out of it. Uh, I have reaction forces at A and B and this T here. So I'll have two unknowns in that. So it's, it's not as convenient to, to work with. So planning your approach and take the time just to figure that out and use your rough work to figure things out and play with it and then map out correctly what you feel your solution is. And again, it doesn't matter really what the answer is per se. I, I'm not really interested in the number. I'm interested in how you are approaching the problem. And that is where the marks are going. And I need to see evidence as to how you get there. And you know, the extreme viewpoint on that is that, well, if you just wrote down all the correct answers and didn't show any workings, you're going to fail. You're going to get zero. 
uh, because there's no evidence of your understanding of it. So make sure you always explain how it is and what it is you were doing. Um, and don't leave it up to me to infer what it is you're doing. Because the default position is uh, that you don't know what you're doing. So you need to show me that you know what you're doing. And that really is the, the key uh, take home message in all of this. Okay, I'll finish there. We're 30 minutes into it. Um, if I have any particular problems, uh, just touch base with me. I'll set up um, a serious thing where I'm available. Uh, we try to do a big blue button meeting or something that um, if you have any specific questions, uh, we can talk directly on that, uh, assuming the syllabus will not be broken down. All right, best of luck. Talk to you again soon. Bye bye.